to the Nanotechnology Industry Association and Joint Nano Safety Cluster webinar on to the joint NIA Nano in Business and EU Nano Safety Cluster webinar on communicating about nanomaterials. Uh, I would ask that everyone please keep their mic keep their microphone muted. Uh, we will tell people when they can unmute for Q and A, and I'd also suggest that if people keep their cameras off, uh, we will we will ask the speakers to put their cameras on when they're actually speaking. But for the rest of us, if we could all keep our cameras off, it just helps preserve the broadband. Just to start the webinar, I'd like to tell you just a few couple of seconds about the Nanotechnology Industries Association. So we're here to support the nanotechnology sector by providing a good robust regulatory framework, helping with business and scientific networking and helping to build the global commercial ecosystem for nanotechnology. Our members come from commercial producers and users of nanomaterials, from people that provide products and services to support that sector and also from research and other national associations. Our activities include publishing regular newsletters. We also publish a lot of news on LinkedIn and on Twitter. We also obviously encourage people to become a member and help drive our activities to help set the priorities for the NIA, be part of our policy and regulatory consultations and help promote themselves and do their own business development. It's a yearly membership scheme uh, and the prices are very reasonable. But if there's any questions, either ask myself or ask Chiara. Also joining us supporting the webinar today is the EU Nano Safety Cluster. Many people in the room will indeed be aware of the EU Nano Safety Cluster and the good work it does. But essentially, it's the high profile platform to help coordinate all of the nano safety research in Europe. It provides good strategic direction for the EU and for the member states. And the cluster is open to all researchers, regulators, industry, civil society representatives to come and join, learn more about the nano safety cluster work that's going on, and also participate in the activities. And I've put the website link here for people to get more information. For the webinar today, uh, we're starting off with a brief introduction and scene setting from the NIA's Director General Chiara. We then will move on to Hannah from the Science Media Centre, who's going to be looking at how you communicate science. We then move on to an industry perspective from Tracy from Serian. And then we'll move into Marie, Valentin and Rob presenting on the Nano Rego blueprint. And finally, Miko will talk about some of the current trends around public communication of nanotechnologies. I would ask that for Q&A, if there's any specific questions to that presentation, we will have a couple of minutes at the end of each session to enable people to ask their questions. But I'd ask people to save things, topics that are more uh, for wider discussion, I'd ask for people to save for the end. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and allow Kiara to take over. And I'll give the stage now to Kiara to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, just a second as I'll share my presentation. And voila. And if you could just confirm that you can see my screen, that would be perfect. Perfect. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, welcome again for me as well. And uh, the purpose of this very brief uh, presentation, which has just disappeared from my screen. Apologies for that. Um, 
the purpose of this setting the scene um, is just to give a very uh, brief overview of why we uh, thought this would be a hot topic and it would be interesting to cover. As anyone who has worked in science and technology knows, um, communicating the results of research or explaining how some new technological solution works can be a bit difficult when doing that to the general public and sometimes things get lost in translation. So an example that we saw last year was uh, with a paper that was uh, released uh, on uh, looking at how nanoparticles of gold were transferred in an aquatic food chain. Um, I know some colleagues from one of the universities that took part in the research are on the call today, but I trust they will not be offended if I say this is probably not something that the general public would add to our bedtime reading. It's um, It was... Um, a normal scientific paper uh, that didn't find anything particularly shocking in its results. However, this is how it was reported in uh, mainstream media. So the, you, you can see the contrast is quite stark. The original research just looked at one type of nanomaterials. It looked at gold and how it is transferred in an aquatic food chain. So um, algae were exposed to equal amounts of that uh, gold. Uh, which came in nanoparticles of different sizes and shapes. The hypothesis being tested being precisely the fact that the differences in the size and shape would influence how much of the gold uh, would then travel further up in the food chain. And this was indeed what was found. Um, because obviously this was only limited to, to one type of nanomaterial and one specific food chain, the conclusion was that further research would be needed and that it would be interesting to try and apply the same method to other types of nanomaterials and other types of food chains. Um, the, the, the media report, however, did not mention gold. It just extrapolated the results as if they were valid for all nanomaterials in general. It also made claims about uh, the presence of nanomaterials in consumer products, such as clothes and cosmetics that do not really have much to do with um, fish food. And also used these fairly sensationalistic headlines about nanomaterials as invisible killers, also claiming that they're more dangerous than COVID, and also made uh, the wrong claim that nanomaterials are not regulated, which might come as a surprise to anyone who has um, manufactured, sold, or used nanomaterials in their products. So, why does this happen? We know that there are different causes that um, make science misrepresented in, uh, in media. One fairly intuitive reason is that this is obviously a very complex topic. So the level of knowledge required to follow scientific explanations is, uh, is sometimes quite high, in particular as regards math, math and the ability to calculate probabilities and assess risk correctly. There's also the fact that the language used is fairly technical, and sometimes papers uh, contain a lot of jargon and acronyms that uh, people who are not specialists in that particular field are not familiar with. And also the fact that this was not the case of the paper that I have mentioned, but uh, a lot of research is actually locked behind a paywall, so the general public does not necessarily have access to it. There is also the fact that as human beings, we're not very good at dealing with uncertainty. We don't like uncertainty, but the scientific process by its very nature is a continuous work in progress. So uh, the fact that sometimes further research is needed and that there is always one more study that could be carried out does not sit well with the fact that we want definitive answers. And then in some fields, there is obviously also some disagreement between the scientists. So it might be difficult for the general public to follow scientific discussions when the scientific community itself does not speak with one voice. If you think, for instance, on uh, food research and all the debate about the links between different food components, such as fat, sugar, salt, and their role in cardiovascular disease or obesity, the scientific community itself is fairly divided on the weight of those different factors. And finally, there is the fact that data, unfortunately, does not always speak for itself because we all uh, process and retain information based on our value system and on the beliefs, the pre-existing beliefs that we already hold. When science is used to inform policy discussions and decisions, 
There is also the fact that those decisions are usually taken um, in the context of discussion where different groups with sometimes conflicting interests come together. And finally, um, there is the fact that not just science journalism, but journalism in general has seen its business model change fairly dramatically over the last couple of decades, um, a change that has been accelerated by the digital revolution, and which means that now it is prevalently dependent on advertising, which in turn creates pressure to uh, create sensationalistic headlines and uh, controversial claims to engage and maintain readership. Now, this is by no means uh, anything new. Uh, you probably have all uh, in mind the more recent examples of the concerns about 5G uh, or about uh, cell phones when they first came on the market and their potential health impacts. But it goes back further than that. So uh, when the electric light bulb was first introduced, uh, there were so many concerns about how it could affect people that hotels um, around the United States started informing their customers that the uh, use of electric lighting could not influence their quality of sleep. Very similar concerns were also related to the introduction of the first telephones. And one of my favorite ones is that when trains were first uh, introduced, their speed, which was about 40, 50 kilometers per hour uh, or 30 miles per hour, uh, which is obviously not great speed when we think about uh, high speed trains today, um, there were still some doctors uh, advising their patients not to travel by train because it was thought the speed could damage their internal organs. And it, it might be tempting to look back and think, well, this was a bit silly. Obviously, we didn't know um, about how the technology worked. But the fact is, um, if these concerns had not been overcome, uh, if these unfounded concerns had not been overcome, we would maybe live in a world with no electricity, no telecommunications, no trains. And uh, a world without nanomaterials means that we would actually miss out on a number of very interesting uh, applications that uh, would, would not only uh, be important for economic growth, but can also give a great contribution to the transition to a sustainable economy. The American Chemical Society has released last December a very interesting paper that looks at the contribution that the nanotechnology can give to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we're now in 2022, so we are really in the last final stretch before 2030, which is the deadline that the United Nations has identified for the achievement of the goals. And so uh, that is why we decided to uh, organize a conversation on how we can try and improve the way we talk about nanomaterials so that we can really try to reap the benefits of this technology and address uh, concerns that might be unfounded. And with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and give the floor back to Sean so that we can really go into the next presentations where we can see more in, from, from a more practical standpoint, how we can try to improve the way we talk about nanomaterials. Thank you. Thanks ever so much for that, Chiara. Uh, so I'll move swiftly on with the first of the presentations from Hannah. So Hannah, you've got the screen hopefully all set up and working, and I shall hand over to you to explain from the science perspective how you can manage communication better. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Sean, and thanks to as well for that intro, because I think that leads quite nicely into what I'm going to talk about, um, and especially that example of the gold in the food chain, because that's the type of study that we at the Science Media Centre um, will try and sort of input some, some scientists into that type of story and stop those headlines that you uh, weren't so keen on. Um, so you should have my screen up and um, let me know if that's not working and I'm just going to whiz through my presentation and I can't stick around to the end, unfortunately, so if you do have any questions. Um, then do you just ask me at the end, I'll try and leave a couple of minutes. Uh, so I'm a press officer at the Science Media Centre. Um, we were set up in uh, 2002, so it's our 20th um, anniversary this year. And this is a period of time where things were going very wrong with science and the media. So this was MMR and autism with the Andrew Wakefield paper, uh, GM crops, BSE and mad cow disease, uh, the sort of fury around animal research, 
And what all these very different science topics had in common was that they were being quite misreported in the media. There was a lot of commentators, a lot of politicians, a lot of public, but very few scientists making their case for why um, those of the science is important to, to take into account here. So a House of Lords uh, Science and Technology Committee um, was set up to look into what went wrong and the Science Media Centre was set up on their recommendation. So, um, sorry, this has just blocked my... There we go. Um, so we're an independent press office for science. We run as a charity. Uh, we're funded by about 120 different science organizations, including universities, journals, uh, research charities, industry, but we maintain complete independence from each of our funders. And we're in the very lucky position that we don't need to worry about getting our name into the media. All we care about is ensuring that scientists' voices are heard on the messy, controversial, scary topics. Um, to better inform the public. So our philosophy is uh, the media will do science better when scientists do the media better. So what we really focus on is getting scientists to engage with the media rather than sort of telling journalists off when they write a bad article, because that just won't do anything really. Um, so just a couple of key things here about why we really think it's important for scientists to engage. So the obvious one being public understanding. You are the experts here. If your area of expertise appears in the media, it's really important that the public get to hear from you. Um, and the media is the best way to do that. Uh, most people get their sort of science information from mainstream media. So if you get a quote or an interview in one of the tabloids, one of the broadsheets, um, then you'll reach loads more people than say a tweet out to your Twitter followers who are probably already quite engaged in the topic. Um, and then the, the last thing is trust as well. So uh, public trust in scientists is really high, way higher than politicians, way higher than many other um, types of people. And so the public are quite likely to listen to what you say if you're quoting the media and to trust what you say. And that could really influence, um, uh, influence behavior and influence policy um, based upon evidence. Uh, so what do you need for media work? Um, you need honesty, you, you need to admit uncertainty, you need to say what we don't know as well as what we do know, um, you need to change your position as the evidence changes, you need to be a scientist fundamentally and be honest about what you know. Uh, you need to be willing to engage, um, you need to act fast, sometimes the media is a lot, lot, lot quicker than the science world um, and often journalists will be wanting something that day that hour. So being available when that happens is really important. And don't leave a void because, as I said before, other, other sort of um, campaigners, politicians, what whatnot will want to get their voices out there. So if you don't do it, then someone else will, and they might be not the best expert. Uh, repeating the same message. This is yeah quite common if uh, you're approached by journalists on things, they'll quite often ask the same question and you have to repeat the same things and resilience, um, not giving up if you if you do see articles that you're not so happy with, but just yeah, sticking at it and keep repeating the evidence and the science because that does usually come out in the long run. Uh, so the way that the SNC works, um, our sort of day-to-day -day work um, is expert comments and media briefings. So I'll go through both of those and hopefully this will be useful in sort of seeing how um, you can enter the media yourselves and just a couple of examples of how you can add uh, some science and evidence to the discussion. Uh, so expert comments, um, I'll go through and give a bit of example. Basically, we constantly monitor the news for, for any breaking stories that have a science element. And we also get access to uh, press releases on new studies from journals and universities. Uh, and the example that I'll show you is, is one of these new studies. Um, but and then when we when we decide that we want to get some comments on one of these stories or studies, we'll send out a request to the scientists on our database. We've got a big database of about 2,000, 3,000 experts across the UK. Um, and we'll go to the relevant sort of keyword for their expertise and ask them to either respond to the breaking news story, to sort of um, speculate intelligently about what might be going on, um, or to give some sort of specific comments on the new study to help journalists um, understand what's going on and put them in context and highlight any uh, caveats and limitations. So the example that I want to show you is one from a couple of years ago, um, and this is looking at a study um, looking at air pollution and Alzheimer's and potential nanomaterial involved. So this was the press release which came out from PNAS. Um, so this is all the journalists got this little bit of information on the paper. Uh, we thought, you know, this is quite a, a scary story. We'll ask uh, our experts in this area if they could take a look and send out some comments to us for us to pass on to journalists to help them understand what's going on here. 
so we had a really a really large of um response from from the scientists that we approached we got comments from all of these experts and this is just to give you a really short example of um, a few of the comments that we got um, I'm a bit short on time so I probably wouldn't let you read all the way through them um, but key things to see is that they're pointing out what we don't know which is really really important to highlight um, you know just making sure that the journalists are aware of uh, how much we can really say from this research and what we can't conclude, highlighting the limitations, talk about the lack of controls, uh, just really adding a note of caution not to get too carried away with this, this single study. Um, and another two here as well. So these comments would go out to all the journalists. So as they're writing up their articles on this topic, they get into their inbox these um, little sort of summaries and critiques from experts in this area to help inform their articles. And then uh, as you can see, this was front page on The Guardian, and they did also include some of our comments. So um, although the, the headline there is, is um, it's correlational rather than causational, it's, it's fairly strong, but you've got quite a large comment in there just pointing out that we need, we need further studies to really understand what's going on here. Uh, and similarly in The Times, um, and you have our comments used in there and in the mail as well. Um, and so, yes, that's just an example of what comments can do. And this can be a really nice way to get involved um, in media work because you can take time over them. You can run them past uh, your press officer um, and get help with them. And yeah, just give you a little bit of control about what's going out there. Uh, so media briefings are another um, one of our things that we do to help scientists get their voices into the media. Uh, this is when in the old days before COVID, we'd get scientists to come into our office and the journalists as well. Um, and they'd listen to a presentation for 20 minutes and then ask questions. And the most common thing that we do this on is a new study and it's particularly controversial, messy, political, uh, sort of challenging, complex that we think the journalists are gonna be really, really interested in. Um, and the, the scientists would just benefit from kind of having an hour to go through it in depth and explain complicated science in detail with all the nuances and caveats. Uh, so yeah, it's normally done on a, new, on a new study, but sometimes we do it on a background topic if that's coming up in the media a lot as well. And we think that it might benefit the journalists to have a sort of restatement of the evidence. Um, so I just wanna give a quick example. This was from coming on two years ago now. Um, and this is just a really nice example of kind of being open about your science and research and uh, heading off sort of potential areas of, of misinterpretation or criticism. So this was the Oxford vaccine, vaccine team just giving an update and we worked with them throughout their whole um, sort of time working on the vaccine as well and would regularly give updates. And they're just a real sort of lovely example of being really open about what they were doing and um, yeah, talking the, to talking the journalists through what they were doing at every stage and just answering questions really um, transparently. Absolutely huge attendance of journalists. Um, and this is them all, all on Zoom. I'm not sure what's going on in the bottom left there. Uh, and then this is the coverage. So yeah, there was, there was no new news here. There was no results. This was just a sort of update on what they were doing. Um, but yeah, led to really, really nice, clear coverage. So this is just an example of how kind of being open about what you're doing um, is, really, is really important for the public understanding of science. Um, so that I just I kind of just shot for everything there, but uh, happy to take any questions and you can um, see more about what we do on our website, sciencemediacenter.org. And we're always on the lookout for really good scientists to join our database to, to help with these comments um, on new studies and breaking news. So if you're interested at all in that, then you can email us at smc at sciencemediacenter.org. And I'll stop sharing my screen and happy to take any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you ever so much for that very interesting presentation with some uh, really good and sort of clear examples. Uh, just quickly before I open up the the floor to see if anyone else has any questions, just a quick one. Obviously, I know you're the UK Science Media Centre. It was more just to see, are there other examples around the world of similar organisations that you can sort of mention? Yeah, so so we were the first one, two thousand and two. But since then, there is a there's a German um, SMC, and they're really active and they're really really good. Um, and they work mostly in Germany, but a little bit across Europe as well. Um, so if you're based in Europe, then they might be good to check out. Uh, and then we do have sister organisations in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, kind of similar ones in Canada and the US, but they work a little bit differently. Uh, there's one starting up in Kenya, 
um, Taiwan. So Spain as well, actually, they're, they're starting this year, hopefully. So it's a, it's a sort of model that is growing. Um, so if you don't have one in your country, watch this space, because hopefully there might be one in, in the coming years. It does seem to be quite popular. Excellent. Thanks, Hannah. So I'd say if anyone has any questions, uh, if you just want to raise your hand quickly and then we can come to you to ask if you have any questions for Hannah. I don't see anyone's hands going up, Hannah, so you must have done an excellent job of telling mm -hmm. everyone the work you do. Uh, so I think unless anyone has a question, no, then I suggest thank you, Hannah, ever so much. I, I personally thought that was really interesting, and I love the sort of example from COVID as well, which really brings it home uh, how important it is to make sure the communication is obviously clear, because obviously uh, the COVID vaccine and public confidence is something that's very easy to uh, lose and probably harder to gain back. So. On that note, uh, thank you so much, Hannah. I shall, thank you. We shall move on to the next speaker. So we move to Tracy from Serian, who's going to tell us a little bit more from a, more of an industry perspective. So Tracy, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Sean. Let me share my screen. Want to make sure that everybody can see that? We can. Excellent. All right, and now you can see me. Well, thank you, Sean, and good morning and good afternoon to all of you. I'm excited to be here to talk about one of my favorite topic areas, communication, and the challenges that we face as nanomaterials organizations when communicating complex topic areas, including during a crisis of myth or disinformation. So to start off, for those of you who don't know who Therian is, we're a company that specializes in the science of designing, scaling up, and manufacturing inorganic nanomaterials for companies developing products or systems. We were founded in 2007, so similar to HANA, we are also celebrating an anniversary this year, 15 years. We have three facilities located here in Rochester, New York, our R&D lab, our manufacturing facility, and our corporate offices. And from here, we support a global base of customers in more than 40 different industries. So we're a services company. So when it comes to communications, we have a double challenge, both communicating what we do plus the science of it. So it goes a little bit beyond media. So let's talk a little bit about strategy and dive right into best practices and fundamentals when it comes to communication. Um, where to start? Fundamentally, you need to answer four key questions when developing communication. Who am I talking to? And for us, it's customers, prospects, media, analysts, academia, one of these groups, two of these groups, all of these groups. What's their background? What do they do? Is it a scientist, engineer, product manager, C-level? Could it be all of them? How are they gonna interact with me? Are they gonna come to my website? Are they gonna find me on social media? Are they gonna see me quoted in traditional media? Are they gonna approach me at a trade show? Or as we are today, listening on a webinar. So once you answer those three fundamental questions, the big question then is, how do I do it? How do I break down or simplify my message to be clear, but come across as an authority? This goes for strategic communication as well as crisis communication. So for example, as I was preparing my presentation for today, I wasn't sure what most of your backgrounds were. I knew that you were probably either a user or maker of nanomaterials, but what was your job within the industry? Why would you be interested in what I had to say? Academic, company, industry organization member? So I tried to develop a conversation here that would resonate both with those familiar or unfamiliar with communication strategy. A few interesting tips and tricks along the way. So how then do you do it? When we're talking about an audience interested in nanomaterials, since they could range from highly technical to absolutely generalist. So a few things to keep in mind when it comes to messaging and messaging strategy. Start with identifying your core topic areas. What does your audience want to hear about? Secondly, stay in your lane. It's important that you don't overreach or try to tackle a topic that's not in your wheelhouse or as Hannah mentioned, answer a question from the media that you don't know the answer to, even if it's important to your audience. For us, we focus on three core competencies. 
our competencies are design, scallop, and manufacturing of nanomaterials. We have in-house experts that contribute to content and the topic areas and the many subtopic areas that go along with them. So IDing your experts internally, who can and should speak on behalf of the company in times of strategic communication, so presenting on a webinar, or in times of crisis communication, reacting to media. You've hired or partnered with them for their experience, use it. Once you've identified the what and the who, you can begin to develop some content. So as a practical example of this, we as a company identified synthesis methods as an important topic area to our key audience. It's in our wheelhouse. And we have experts on staff that can contribute to a piece of content about it. We subsequently published an article and on our website and on social media. And we developed several videos and articles as well on our website um, that are more strategic in nature for our less technical audience. So we have pieces that address our technical audience and our less technical audience on topics such as commercialization and global trends as it relates to nanomaterials specifically. So let's talk about how to develop that content, some key considerations and best practices that we use. Content development at its core is extremely difficult. If any of you have ever done it or had to write a paper or an article or a blog or have been asked to contribute to an article, You've identified the key areas that are interesting to your audience or a key topic that is timely and relevant. So where do you go from here? You're likely dealing again with a highly diverse audience, technical, non-technical, a number of job titles or industries. No matter what the topic area is, always use a few of these best practices to help you synthesize what you wanna say. So outline your article, blog, video, or other vehicle, email ahead of time. This will pay dividends in the long run. It'll help you organize your thoughts and also think through the actual layout of the piece. Layout, including subheadlines and quotes, are much more important than you might think. The organization of the piece is key in making your communications clear and engaging your audience. Secondly, make the language as easy to understand as possible. As Hannah said, here's a true story. My son was working on his thesis in geochemistry. His advisor was like, too many words simplify, no matter how many edits or iterations he went through, the research was solid. It was just the language he was using that made it difficult to read and understand. Take out the unnecessary or duplicative language. Once you've made a strong point that's clear, just move on. So third, again, give examples. Use examples as a way to illustrate your point. Quotes from industry experts also go a long way to reinforce ideas, concepts, or create added credibility for your topic. Imagery. Sometimes the topics that we talk about when it comes to nanomaterials or science in general are much better illustrated with images, charts, graphs, anything but words. <laughs> Use this tool not only to help reinforce your point, but draw the reader in, keep their attention. And first and foremost, I think Hannah mentioned this as well, we're all human. Your words are the link between the technology and the people who use it. Choose and use your words wisely to both make your point and make a connection with your audience. So now you've got your content. How do you get people to read it? What do you do with your content? For us as a company, we need to make sure that our content is used in a way that entices our audience to engage with us, wherever they are in their buying or development journey. That means ensuring we're available wherever they're searching for information. So how do you know where they are? Um, this could involve some research on your end up front and answering the where are they question. This will help you identify which delivery methods you should use for your content so you can build credibility and, it's, and thought of as you're continuing to build your authority with your key audiences. Consistency with messaging is critical across all of your engagement tactics. So your website, your social media, traditional re media, radiate that message appropriately based on the delivery vehicle. Keep it simple, keep it regular. Consistency in communications is key. Secondarily, industry organizations like the NIA are a blessing for all of us. Understanding what like companies and individuals are experiencing and having a format for discussion and learning and at the end of the day, policy influencing will help build a collective knowledge base and understanding of a complex topic area like nanomaterials. 
Equally, if not most importantly, being known as a key resource to your customer or your key audience and elevating your importance to them all the time, even when you're not working with them. So as a company, whether our key audience, companies that develop products or systems, have new projects, or even when they don't, it's critical to continue to be their resource for information. Ultimately, this creates an initial brand affinity. And once you work with them, brand champions. So thinking ahead, this is really important. You've got messaging, you've got a strategy, and you've got some content as a starting point. Thinking long-term and also planning for the unexpected is essential to your communication strategy. You've got to continually ask yourself, what's next? This is never a one and done situation. Continue to be educated on current affairs, topics that impact the industry, new technology, processes, or application areas so that you can consistently develop relevant content and conversations for your audience. That's step one from a long-term strategy perspective. You also need to think about what happens if, or ultimately when, as Hannah and Kiara both pointed out, there is a paper published or a press release that creates a negative perception of the industry, a particular material, or even your business or your specialty area. We all know this is bound to happen. So prepare for it. You've identified your area of expertise. You have your experts in-house. Make sure you can activate them if and when it's time. I also absolutely recommend baking in media training to your long-term strategy for any and all of your team members. This is something we've actually done and I can tell you it's an enormous help and very well received, particularly from our scientists. They're not experts in communication. It gets them comfortable and gets the entire team on the same page as far as consistent, and clear messaging on behalf of the organization. So identifying an organizational spokesperson or subject matter expert for certain topic areas that can help craft your response in a crisis. One person and one person only should be the company spokesperson when it comes to responding to media to ensure the consistency again and that clear message. Reach out to your industry organization to gauge their response, get ahead of the swirl and get everyone on the same page. Again, having this opportunity to connect with others in your industry, particularly in a time of crisis is critical. Reaching out to key stakeholders, both internally and externally, making sure your internal team members, as well as your vendors, partners and customers, especially in times of dis or misinformation, are armed with accurate and consistent information and updates. We all know we've seen it. It has happened a lot with COVID-19 and the mis and disinformation, as well as just internally policy, politics, and making sure everyone is on the same page when it comes to combating this virus. Additionally, proactive media outreach if necessary. So I think Hannah mentioned, you know, there are a lot of media that often you know, take hold of one topic area or one headline and propagate that myth or disinformation because they really don't know the whole story. Reach out to them, address it directly, you know, use resources like Hannah to do that. So measuring success. At the end of the day, how do you know your message is getting across? How do you know you're making an impact? How do you know you're being clear? How are you influencing as a thought leader as you'd hope to? Measuring success for us as a business is critical. We're constantly looking at data points to shift and adjust our communication strategy to ensure we're hitting several key milestones. First and foremost, building and maintaining our credibility in the industry, establishing new and deepening relationships with customers, partners, et cetera and expanding our reach and developing new advocates based on thought leadership. So consistently expanding the audience of folks that we're talking to, folks that are hearing our message and folks that we're engaging with, whether that's in person or via online opportunities. And finally, again, anticipating and mitigating negative industry perceptions. So have a plan. Okay, that's all I've got for today. Thank you again for inviting me. This is really just scratching the surface, as you know, when it comes to communication strategy. I only had a few minutes today 
but I could talk forever about this topic area. So feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any additional questions, or now if you have any additional questions, reach out if you wanna discuss any of these elements in more detail at a later time, I'd be happy to have a conversation. Thank you. Tracy, thanks so much for a very interesting and stimulating presentation. If anybody has any sort of immediate question uh, to ask Tracy, we can take that now. If not, then I'll ask you to sort of wait until we have the general discussion at the end. But I'll open up the floor if there's any sort of immediate questions. No, nope. okay. In which case, it only leaves me to say, Tracy, thanks ever so much. Uh, I'm Thank sure there'll be some questions for you at the end. Uh, and on that note, I shall hand over to uh, Marie Valentin and to Rob Aitken, who is going to talk about the uh, blueprint for risk communication and governance being developed in some of the projects. Hello, okay. Shandis. Yes, um, this is Marie Valentin. I don't see uh, Rob, but Rob, are you online? Yes. I'm online. I'm here, Marie Valentin. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Would you share your screen or shall I sh sh share it for you? I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. okay. Just for give me a moment while we. You can see that. Um, so uh, thanks for uh, for joining this. Thanks to NIA uh, for organising and creating the opportunity, and also to, uh, the MR uh, for uh, organising this particular session. Probably, uh, and Rob, Bill just Levy, to, I was keeping it off. I am. Uh, Rob, just to pause you there, you're really breaking up badly. So as I said, I'm, I'm Robbie, Robbie, and I, I, I was until recently chief executive of, of IOM based in Edinburgh. Um, this is a, a build as an interactive session, but um, Marie Valentin and myself uh, uh, thought we'd uh, introduce this with uh, a few slides, really interesting subject of where now all I need to now this governance house. Um, and uh, what I'm, what this is really about is uh, three projects which were funded by the e framework program uh, under a call code NMB13. The three projects are Nano Rego, uh, Gov for Nano, and Risk. So it was really these three projects, and we were tasked with um, uh, improving risk governance in uh, for nano materials in Europe, particularly. The three projects were funded separately, but they were essentially required by the Commission to audit common outputs. And so we're talking about today the um, risk governance house is, is one of these. Um, I think people on the, on the call will be aware of, of you know many of the challenges that that, that still surround and nanotechnology and nanomaterials. Um, you know, there are across a broad range of industries and applications. And um, despite, you know, good working, really great work over the last 15 years, trying to um, address concerns about nanomaterials, uh, they still remain. So there are still concerns about nano risk um, across a whole range of things. Uh, there's issues like uh, difficulties and, and uh, lack of some under around risk assessment guidelines, which which remain a little bit fragmented. And there's a need to develop <clears throat> appropriate governance structures, which are uh, which ensure the trust and, and build the trust of all stakeholders. All of this in uh, an infor information landscape that is very um, uh, very difficult to navigate. Um, I see a message from Andreas that the audio is still being interrupted quite badly. 
Marie Valentine, maybe it would be better if you yeah. if you try okay, to I'll take, take over. Take I'll take over from here. No problem. Yes. Thank you. So sorry. The, about the main. That. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that, everyone. So um, I've been working with Rob and others in this uh, in these uh, three projects uh, from my side of from on Nanorigo, and um, uh, the, the objective that we have we have been pursuing with this project is is to build a self-sustainable um, European Risk Governance Council. Uh, that's, that means an organization that would support work in Europe to improve the governance of risks related to uh, nanomaterials. Um, now we are we have been taking some distance uh, from the World Council and from now on in this presentation I will I will uh, I will speak of the house um, and and but that's that's a small nuance that we have just discussed with the European Commission so uh, our job here is to help others develop necessary and appropriate conditions for an efficient and effective risk governance process for nanotechnologies. Um, we, we don't mean here that uh, there's nothing out there. There's already a lot of good work being done. And we have, we have been looking for a kind of, um, if there is any gap or deficit that would, uh, that would need um, something new, something else, something different. Um, and, and we've started uh, working on, on, a, on a comprehensive um, and a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder framework. Uh, a number of you are familiar with, uh, with the IRGC framework for, for risk governance, which has been adapted to nanotechnology, uh, which has been adapted by the Calibrate project. So the idea of is, having, is to have a kind of formal process, you know, that will structure the way you assess risk, you set the context in which um, uh, risk and, and, and opportunities develop, you uh, assess the risk and in, uh, assess the perception of the risk, you uh, manage the risk, you communicate risk and benefits, and this is why this session is particularly important to, to us. Uh, and, 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 and finally, you, you review decisions. So um, this, is, this has been at the core of what we believe could be useful um, uh, as hosted by uh, perhaps a new organization or perhaps an existing organization um, that would, uh, main, I mean, that would take this framework that we've been developing further and, and operate it and help others use it. In addition to that, there is a portal, um, which is basically um, a, a gate uh, to access information, data, secondary data, um, tools to uh, assess the risk and manage the risk and also communicate the risk. Uh, the expected outcome of this project is um, indeed uh, a, a new organization that would stimulate the safe and sustainable development, use and disposal of nanomaterials in Europe. Um, you recognize probably that this is in the context of the new chemical strategy for sustainability, which among other things um, recommends uh, the development of criteria and methods to develop safe and sustainable by design nanomaterials. And, and we know that there's a lot of work in Europe around this. Uh, we want to contribute to that. Um, we are working with others to do it in such a way that we don't compete with others, but we just fill the gaps, as I said. Um, we think that this um, um, organization um, could be, I mean, it has to be, in fact, uh, independent, trustworthy, self-sustained, which means um, uh, financially um, uh, viable. Uh, we also think it's important that it helps bridge uh, gaps between knowledge generators and decision makers, basically between science or scientists and decision makers. We know this is not um, uh, the, I mean, with, this is a recurring uh, issue in many domains, but in, in the very specifics uh, of, of nanotechnology, it is particularly true. Uh, we work with others and support existing actors and this will be pro provide activities and promises for all stakeholders. So we have designed this kind of house. And this house uh, has many rooms, if I would say. Um, it has a gate, which is the portal and the framework. And uh, th these many rooms uh, would, would do things such as, um, and I will go through this um, uh, slide quickly, data management and curation. So looking into the data that are needed to improve the assessment and the management, uh, looking at the tools and the toolbox, uh, which instruments are available, which instruments should be improved to assess and manage uh, risks. Um, governance of sustainability, safety and sustainability by design is also quite uh, an important rule in that uh, house. 
Uh, development and support of methods and standardization is a recurring theme. Engaging stakeholders, I will come back to that separately because this is one of the main feature of the operating mode of that, of that house. And finally, uh, uh, we need to enhance skill and competences um, uh, in various ways, um, ways uh, beginning with including involving experts and then of course, uh, training and educating others to become experts. So it could look like this. Uh, we are creating um, a generic problem solving capability, which uh, could add value in specific areas, such as in refining and implementation, the chemical strategy for sustainability, safety and, uh, safety and sustainability by design, but also the Green Deal, uh, the strategy for circular economy, in Europe and, and other um, important um, um, policy decisions. Um, we're not providing a solution per se. Um, we're not providing um, something where you can, you can just go and get the, something ready to use. Um, it's, it's more a kind of structure, a place and a process um, where uh, for the development of collaborative response strategies. We insist very much on the term collaboration um, and this is, this is basically the whole idea of this house where people can come and discuss and talk and elaborate uh, response strategies to problems. Um, so the multidisciplinary approach is really key and central to this venture. Um, Multi-stakeholder organization, meaning uh, there's not only regulators or that would perhaps call industry to join, but, but, but everybody's equal there in terms of contribution and participation, um, meaning uh, policy making, regulation, uh, industry, NGOs representing either certain specific aspects or just public, uh, public opinion and civil society. Um, so but coming back to this uh, figure of the house, um, so we have the rooms at the bottom of the, of the, the slide. Um, on the right slide, on the right part of that slide, uh, you see the expected output uh, that this organization uh, would would aim to uh, will aim to produce uh, cooperation, a really increase interdisciplinary collaboration. This is something we have that has come across to us through a number of many many consultations with individual stakeholders as being critically important. Everybody has something to contribute, and it's only by collaborating better and more. Um, that we can enhance uh, the, 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 the management of both opportunities and risks. Um, safety, second, safety and sustainability of innovation are really at the center of our attention. Uh, we will offer better access to information uh, on risk governance. What is it, what is it that, risk, that we call risk governance? For, for some of you, this has, may have different meanings. Um, uh, the fourth item is support effort to, effort to improve quality and access to information on nanomaterials and their risk of benefits. So that's the portal function, you know. And then um, uh, we I think that it would be important to, to some extent to focus on emerging issues. Emerging issues are issues that are not well understood, not well characterized. There is a lack of instruments to address them. Sometimes the regulatory frameworks are not quite fit for that. So any issues that is not well discussed, covered by other organizations. And, and finally, um, uh, we think we need uh, to provide guidelines and processes for assessing, managing, and communicating risks. To finish uh, this, this in short introduction to this uh, house, um, I'm showing on this uh, last slide a list of activities. Uh, so to be more specific than perhaps I was so far, um, because this is this will be kind of the blueprint of what the organization will do in 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 in, uh, in various ways. Um, I will go quickly through these uh, five types of activities, but starting from the round table, which is the fourth you see on the list. Uh, the round table is um, really the kind of um, the kind of principles that we think could um, could lead to effective communication, effective dialogues. Uh, the idea of, the, of, a, of a table that is round and you have everybody around that table um, from dis different disciplines, from different stakeholders, it's basically a neutral convening place. Everybody has a seat on the table. You know. um, the, the, the second uh, activity that I would like to go through quickly is the governance, frame, the governance framework that you have on the top of this, of this slide. 
the governance framework is a kind of operating system, uh, like in a computer, you know. It's the process by which the work to, towards improvement of assessment and management and communication of risks uh, will be will be will be will be organized. You know, um, as I said before, some of you are familiar with the RGC framework for risk governance. Basically, that framework says you have to set the scene, look at the context, assess the perception, as well as the technical aspects of the risk, and don't forget also the benefits and the trade-offs that you'll have between the, the risk and the benefits and the trade-offs between various substances or materials that uh, that is what we are faced with in the day-to-day -day work um, and uh, so that's that framework is really the operating mode of this uh, of the of the house and what and, it, and its work uh, the the third uh, activity that i would like to um, emphasize as being relevant to this to this house and today's meeting is the is the portal uh, the portal is the place by which you have access to, um, to information, to data, to tools. It's a kind of online port, it's a gate um, that you enter through and then we offer you access to a lot of things. Of course, not uh, there are already existing organizations in Europe that do that. So we, have, we are working with them now to see exactly how this can be organized. This, but this has been identified in numerous consultations by something that uh, this new uh, this new house organization could do. And the last um, uh, two service activities are um, foresight, uh, foresight on emerging issues. Um, um, emerging issues um, are issues that are, as I was saying before, not well uh, identified or characterized. Uh, take for example, if one day someone would say, uh, oh, there is a problem with um, um, where I mean where, with a wear and tear process from rubber tires on road. Uh, how do we deal with that? You know, who are the stakeholders? Who should we bring to the table? Uh, so this would be an emerging issue in the sense that there is no um, established process to to deal with this kind of issue, which quite often is seen as rather urgent and can escalate quite quickly. Uh, another emerging issue would be smart nanomaterials um, and basically going, going towards third and even fourth generation of, um, of nano, um, nanomaterials, um, nano-based systems, uh, which uh, fall into the traps uh, of a number of regulatory uh, uh, frameworks at this moment. So it's, it's, emerging, it's an emerging technology and um, th this house could sort of explore how to how to assess and manage the the the, 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 the uh, assess and, and regulate uh, this kind of uh, nanomaterials. And finally, advice is basically the 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 cherry on the cake, if I would say, uh, because uh, in the end, uh, this organization must be able to provide either recommendations or advice for consideration by others, for, for consideration by industrial regulators. This is not a regulatory institution. This is just a kind of anti-chamber, uh, if we speak of the house, that to, to prepare uh, decisions by industry, by NGOs, and by regulators and others. So I'll, I'll stop here and then I will um, like pa pass over to the, the Kema and uh, I think Nils um, Bomer who has prepared a few questions uh, um, uh, for you so that we try to make this session a bit more interactive if I may yeah yes Marie Valentin thank you very much uh, also for your talk and also Rob uh, despite the technical hiccups I think it was uh, very interesting also for the audience and we are looking forward now really to a short uh, survey which we uh, collected for you uh, for you as the experts in the audience to help us also to refine, develop further and to sustain the envisioned structure of the NMBP 13 projects. And I already posted a, a link in the chat and maybe Marie Valentin, you can uh, quickly share your screen again with the last slide with the QR code so that uh, everybody is able to, to go to menti.com and enter uh, the code. Um, and my colleague Nadia will then share the screen, uh, screen quickly in a minute um, that we can go quickly through the questions, which are not uh, or easy. <laughs> not every uh, question is easy to answer. Thank you, Marie. Yeah, Valentin and uh, Nadia, maybe you can uh, already share your screen now with the questions. Great. Oh, yeah. And I see uh, some of you already uh, entered some information there. So I guess after two years of remote meetings, you're really experienced how to use Menti and, and other tools. So that's great to see. 
uh, maybe uh, we just wait a, a couple of seconds to to get more people involved from the audience because I can see we have uh, 55 people uh, attending. So maybe uh, some more of you would be willing to help us uh, to to refine our plans. That would be great. Oh, interesting. Okay, it's not only Europe. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> Great, so uh, thank you very much. So uh, people are coming. Great, just a quick warm up question and then we will dive directly into the topic and also to save some time for our last speaker today and not to consume the, the whole time of the meeting. <laughs> so, okay, thank you, Nadia. Maybe we can we can quickly go to, to the next question already because you can also uh, end for later uh, in the questionnaire if you missed the beginning, if you used the code. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, first question from our side is, are you personally satisfied with how risks from engineered nanomaterials currently are assessed and managed in Europe? This is a very uh, important question. So is, is there a need uh, also for us to, to improve things? Okay. Interesting, some of you are satisfied. A lot of you don't know, <laughs> which is, which is uh, obvious because uh, some of you are not, uh, are not uh, active in Europe. So <laughs> it might be difficult to, to answer this question if you are not based in Europe with your business. Okay, and then the other ones are yeah, quite equal, six to seven, okay. Still answers coming in. Great, thank you. Nadia, maybe you can go to the next slide because this is uh, the, the fourth slide. Um, are you personally satisfied with how risks of uh, engineered nanomaterials will be assessed and managed in Europe in the future? This refers to questions like the third generation of uh, nanomaterials, smart and active nanomaterials, advanced materials, things like these who, uh, which are uh, being currently discussed uh, in Europe. And if there is a need, um, to improve also the regulation in this respect and also the communication of, uh, about these emerging technologies. Okay, a lot of you, you don't know, that's, that's fine, that's perfectly fine. It's also a very good result because uh, then we, we have something to do to improve also the communication uh, about this. Thank you very much. Then we come quickly to the next question. Uh, this is maybe a bit more uh, tricky. So do you think that the development of a problem solving capacity, what was uh, described by Marie Valentin before, would be necessary or, uh, and or beneficial to you, such as our EU nano risk governance house, for example, or another organization or entity? Okay, yes, a lot of you seem to think that is a good idea. I'm really glad to see this because not uh, a lot of uh, colleagues from our NBP 13 projects are on the call uh, who are clearly biased, <laughs> I know that, but there are a lot of uh, people also who are not that familiar maybe with uh, NBP 13 projects. So thank you for this answer. So a bit more in detail, maybe, what benef benefits do you see in our non-risk governance house, if any? So um, maybe you can already think about, so what, what will be uh, improve your daily life in your professional work? So what is uh, what are things which uh, you are searching for? I think this is an open question, Nadia, right? So everybody could... Um... Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> and so whatever I think the you, first yeah. answers will come quickly. Great. Yeah. Usually this yeah. takes a bit more time than just clicking yes, yes, no, or I don't know. So, oh, great. Uh, already answers coming in. Central information point. Yeah, that's a good thing. This is something which is uh, really also on the mind of the um, project partners. Easy access is also something. Yeah, that's really... I mean, uh, also from my uh, personal point of view, I think information is a bit, um, yeah, um, scattered sometimes uh, in the internet, not easy to find for every stakeholder. 
Okay, I see that uh, several times central inf info point, great. Access to information, this is uh, clearly something which is which is needed. Neutral evaluation of assessments. Yeah, that's is also something that uh, builds trust also uh, in every stakeholder. Thank you. Okay, many, many very, very um, good ideas. Still answers coming in, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Nadia. I think we have now 16 answers, which is really great. Thank you very much, 17. <laughs> so next question, in your view, who should contribute funding to it? I mean, this is also a tricky question. Uh, we are thinking about if we, if we want to ask this question before, but because usually someone says, uh, okay, if it's not me, then it's fine. Um, so it uh, will be interesting. What will be your answers? Because this is something we, we are working now on in the NABP 13 projects, how to sustain also the organization or um, the structure which we are developing. And uh, there's a special group working also on developing business plans um, for all the aspects we have shown in the presentation. So this is something really, as we are entering now the final year of the project, really something which is very important for us. Uh, so how to tackle this question, okay. A combination, yeah, combination is uh, at the moment the favorite answer of EU national governments, industry and NGOs, so really a multi-stakeholder initiative. Thank you for this. I think, Nadia, then we can just go on to the, yeah, great, 26 answers now. Thank you very much. This is an open question again. Yeah, okay. So when we will use a bit more time for this, also to give you time to digest the question. So what, if anything, should happen to enhance trust between industry and societal stakeholders? And I saw this point already in the other open question that this is something that we should address also within this structure. So maybe there are some um, ideas already so what, what could be done uh, to, to um, improve this? Uh, avoid greenwashing, yeah. Thank you. Maybe uh, Marie Valentin, you already have some some uh, thoughts about this as you're really also uh, into this topic. Um, indeed, um, we we do think that uh, communication and dialogue is at really at the core of enhancing trustworthiness uh, between stakeholders. There's been already lots of uh, lots of uh, initiatives uh, to that. Um, it's it's a difficult issue. Uh, we, I mean, there's no perfect solution. Um, it's not a silver bullet. It's only by engaging and engaging again and again in a in a with a good mindset, uh, mindset towards uh, constructive thinking, um, that that progress can be can be made. But but basically, industry is pursuing certain objectives. NGOs are pursuing other objectives. Regulators are pursuing. Another set of objectives. Um, it's I see I see here an answer that was saying um, aligning objectives uh, or something like this. That was I think very very important. But I I, I really appreciate the many questions, the many answers that come that are coming across at this moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed, this is really great. Uh, thank you and thank you uh, in the audience that you take the time and uh, to think about this really important topic. Um, we will enter now the, the last three multiple choice questions. So this will be quick questions uh, to the end of this session, but really important for us to, to have an idea of what, what you are thinking. So do you think that a new organization that would be tasked precisely with this role would be useful? And possibilities, yes, there is no suitable organization in Europe or no, other organization can do it properly. I mean, there are actors already uh, who are doing kinds of this work. So 
maybe. Yeah, and if I may add something, uh, Niels, um, of course. it's extremely important to us to not create competition, to not uh, to, to complement what others are doing and to not uh, overlap and, and really create uh, anger or resentment uh, from other organizations. We've worked a lot with, uh, we've discussed a lot with E.ON, with uh, PARC, the, the new PARC initiative, um, uh, even with REACH, um, with people from European Commission, the, the, the DGs, uh, Environment, uh, Research and others. Um, this, I mean, if I, if I could add one thing about this so-called organization, which we called in our uh, presentation a house, it could be informal, it could be temporary, it could be very different from the kind of institutions that we are familiar with. Basically, it's it's a project, it's an initiative, you know, it could be um, one of the current institutions that says, um, I'm long, launching this initiative, you know, to organize this round table, round table discussion about, uh, I don't know, smart nanomaterials or rubber ties in, 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 um, um, of, or, I mean, the, the release of, of nanomaterials by robotized uh, tear process. So it's, we, we have to be very open and flexible here. Thank you also for the explanation, Marie Valentin. Yeah, that's a really sensitive topic. Uh, I know that. So mm -hmm. yeah, and really uh, interesting feedback for us and we will digest this in, in the projects and uh, we'll use it to refine our plans. Thank you very much. So I think that the next question is also, it, uh, would you be interested in participating in our EU nano risk governance house generally? So no commitment today. So if you click yes, we will not directly contact you <laughs> and say, okay, in which role? So it's just uh, for us to have a feeling if there is an interest also to, to have an active part um, to help also um, with the goals of this structure. Because there are many, many uh, rooms which uh, think, uh, we think about at the moment. So uh, all these rooms need people uh, who, who live in this and, and fill it with, with life. So, okay, a lot of people would say yes at the moment, great. So this is really, really a good, good uh, feedback. Thank you very much. Now we are just coming to the last question for today. So to have also save some time for the last speaker today. So if so, what round table would you see yourself participating in? And uh, Marie Valentin already uh, explained which ones uh, will be maybe or could be in inside the house. So which would be your main interest if you if you would be participating. Yeah, Marie So we are, we are fully aware that uh, you may not have enough information to provide um, a relevant answer or a, a fully informed an answer to this question. So please just say as, 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 I mean, intuitively, what would you say? Are you more interested in data? Uh, uh, are you more interested in, in developing skills and competences? Are you more interested in, in um, engaging with others? Um, are you more interested in methods? Uh, or are you more interested in uh, um, the, the implementation of the European chemical strategy for sustainability, and in particular, developing criteria and methods for assessing um, and managing safety and sustainability by design? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And uh, this was our last question for today. So thank you all for the very nice feedback. We will use it uh, internally also uh, for our further planning. And thanks a lot also to Marie Valentin and Rob again for the great presentation and Nia for the possibility to present here for this uh, great audience. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Nils and everybody else and participating in that. We move on uh, rather swiftly now because we are running slightly behind schedule to Miko, who's going to tell us a little bit about current trends with public communication and those technologies. And then after Miko, we'll move very swiftly on to Q&A and discussion. So Miko, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Sean. Um, uh, we are also one of the partners in the one of the NMB13 projects Cover Nano discussed before. And uh, I'm happy to discuss with you some of the work that we have been doing in the project. Um, just to introduce us briefly, I'm from, I'm from Dialogue Basis. We are an independent science-based uh, consultancy ba working with stakeholder dialogues and public participation uh, based in Germany, but also on European level. 
uh, we work with emerging technologies such as nano and biotechnologies, but also with issues of climate change, energy, energy transition or digital transformation. Uh, as just said before, in Gaffer Nano, um, we have also been working with one of the sort of cornerstones or small pieces of the possible uh, risk governance council or house have been mainly involved with uh, one of the tasks in Gaffer Nano that has to do with information needs and uh, communication with civil society. And um, as Marie Valentin and Rob presented before, um, different stakeholders uh, would be sort of directly involved in the work of the house, uh, including civil so established civil society organizations. That's at least our view for that. So that in our task, we have been focusing uh, mainly on lay people, uh, normal people on the street with, uh, with perhaps that, not that uh, deep knowledge in uh, on nanotechnologies and nanomaterials. What we have been doing is that um, we have sort of compiled and analyzed previous public perception studies that have been conducted on nanomaterials in the past years, then complemented this, um, this bulk of research with uh, sociological risk research studies on how individual risk perceptions, um, especially those of lay people, emerge and then drawing on these, uh, drawing on this style, this literature um, conducted different expert interviews on um, the public information that is available on nanomaterials and uh, possible communication needs that, um, that perhaps exist today. We have talked with um, different nano stakeholders from industry research public institutions and CSLs, um, also representatives of existing information platforms such as UON or, or the Dana platform, but also with uh, bloggers, um, social media influencers who are not primarily focused on nanomaterials and can sort of uh, provide us a, uh, with a view from the outside. And based on this, uh, we have developed some uh, concrete recommendations on public communication of nanomaterials, discussed these with our um, interview partners. Um, our recommendations pertain primarily um, to sort of public communication, the council or house uh, might be active in, active in, but uh, can also discussed on a bit more general level. I'll keep this one brief. Um, what we know about public perception of nanomaterials, um, I, I guess you're. Uh, this is something that you, most of you well know. The um, different surveys that have been conducted since early 2000s paint a quite coherent picture. The public perception is nano is generally mildly positive and uh, more positive than that of some other technology fields, a bit more negative than some others. But yet most people consider nanomaterials to have a positive impact on our way of life. And um, as you sure know as well, the perceptions however vary according to application areas or products, especially how close the materials come to, come to one's body. And uh, what still always needs to be stated is that uh, many people in Europe at least still um, know only little, little about nanomaterials or have not heard of them at all. And um, of course, considering this limited knowledge, individual risk, risk perception of lay people does not uh, equal with scientific risk, risk assessment. Um, the project NanoView of the German Federal Institute of Risk, risk Assessment um, compiled a couple of years ago different factors that play a part here when uh, lay people assess uh, risks of new technologies, new materials such as nanomaterials. They range from uh, object-related factors such as um, general knowledge about science or interest towards new technologies, potential risks and benefits of the, of the technologies in question, but also include socio-demographic factors, 
psychosocial factors such as um, general attitudes towards technology or nature, political attitudes, values, trust in institutions, and general feeling of security and welfare in the society. Whereas the public perceptions have remained quite constant, the public attention nanomaterials or nanotechnologies uh, enjoy has definitely changed in the last 15 years. As you also know, nano uh, sort of entered the limelight as a curiosity driven uh, new field of research, but has then since then in the, developed to an, uh, to an uh, enabling technology uh, present in, in many, many application fields. And at the same time, the use of nano as a public buzzword has declined. If we look at, for instance, at uh, Google queries for nanotechnologies in, uh, in the last 15 years, we see that we have come quite much down from the peak in uh, early 2000s. Um, same kind of pictures and graphs uh, could be made for media articles, but um, the experts that we have talking to also from the different information platforms say, however, that um, public interest is not waning, but uh, rather changing. So whereas we before um, public discussed nanomaterials or nanotechnologies in general, also the visitors of the websites pose more specific questions on the risks and benefits of individual materials and applications and uh, and, and sort of search for information in a more focused way. At the same time, we have also know that the public discussion of uh, different new technologies has changed profoundly. We have the breakthrough, breakthrough of social media uh, in, in the last 10 years. Um, you all know about the vast user numbers, but what is perhaps important for our discussion is the emergence of different bubbles, um, different influencers on Instagram, TikTok, or other platforms who deliberately construct communities that, based, that are based around similar worldviews and values. And this development of bubbles is strengthened by algorithms of the different platforms as well, who suggest uh, suitable content for the users based on their previous interests. Why this is then important for us is that as a result, we see a bit more unpredictability in the public discussion. These different influencers who enjoy a lot larger audiences than public or scientific organizations often do, and more and more often also discuss uh, much broader topics, not just lifestyle, fashion, and gaming, but also politics and technology that uh, especially seen during the pandemic. So that we have a um, situation where topics that were previously left for experts and stakeholders are more and more often uh, discussed by people with very various scientific background, drawing on very diverse sources, knowledge and worldviews. And uh, what is perhaps even more striking is that the different surveys and barometers that focus on the issue of trust, who the people, uh, who the lay people trust as uh, sources of information when it comes to products, companies, or technologies, say that say yes, that um, information that's shared by influencers or peers, persons like me and you, like yourself is often trusted just as much or even more than information from public or academic or scientific sources. And this is, of course, something that's, that's, that's a um, specific challenge for us uh, working in the field of uh, science communication. Um, the COVID, COVID pandemic had, has led to, to a widespread attention to these influencers, um, quite interestingly. Um, different governments across the globe, from the White House to Germany and Finland, all reached out to different influencers in the last year in order to promote the different vaccines. Um, and um, we also 
also have indications from uh, from from a lot of different dubious sources also trying to trying to tamper with the platforms or feed uh, feed deliberate information uh, to the platform so that this is certainly an area where uh, lots lots is going on and despite the fact that um, cause that that um, study has to be studied uh, uh, studied more except exactly what kind of influence uh, the influencers there especially have. So what does this then mean for public communication of nanomaterials? At least according to the experts that we inter interviewed, um, there is no large fire at the moment that needs to be put out. Nanomaterials are not in the focus of ne negative public attention, and uh, there are also no indications that nanomaterials as a whole, as an enabling technology, would become subject to, a, to such an uh, extensive public debate as uh, the vaccines for instance. We also have knowledge on the risks and safety of different nanomaterials and uh, public information platforms in place already EU-wide in some member states and uh, also globally. At the same time, um, thanks to the diversity of the nanomaterial of nanomaterials and uh, their use, it is of course possible and plausible that some materials become subject to negative public attention. In Europe, this uh, has been the case in the last years, for, for instance, by with titanium dioxide, although the debate there was not primarily uh, nano-specific, but shows, however, how a how a um, material that's been used for many years in the market may become uh, subject to such, such public discussion. As we heard already in the beginning from Kiara and the others, there are misrepresentations in media. The civil society and public discussion of the different technologies have become more unpredictable. And therefore, the existing communication channels should not be reinvented com completely, but complemented in a way that allows a timely response and sharing of relevant science-based information. With our interview partners, we uh, formulated some recommendations uh, based on these, uh, these ob observations and um, conclude first that there is no inherent need for everyone to know about nanomaterials. If we say that people still know little about them, the first reflex is always to think about large information information campaigns um, to educate, educate the masses. But uh, at least from our point of view, it is enough if uh, the public communication provides the opportunity for those people interested to make scientifically sound, so make, uh, make informed, informed choices based on scientifically sound information. Considering the fact that, um, that different information platforms are there already EU-wide, we do not see the need, see the need to duplicate them, for instance, uh, within the house or the council, but to further link to them, uh, strengthen them and um, support them as, uh, as, as uh, EU-wide platforms. Same time, we, however, need see a need to monitor public discussion on individual nanomaterials, emerging topics, misrepresentations, and this includes, of course, not only scientific literature but also mass uh, mass and uh, social media, as um, as the other speakers brought forward. To. And when required, when these sort of uh, situations occur. Uh, we need to prepare for it, as Tracy said, and have these um, have channels in place where we can then communicate in a nuanced, easy to answer, understand way what we know about the different materials, about their risks and safety in the context of their of their benefits. Considering the fact that um, most 
discussions or many discussions today take place in the sphere of social social media and uh, this trust um, different peers influencers gain. The communication and information should be made as easy to understand, but also easy to share as possible. So, uh, in addition to press releases, traditional communications, infographics, fact sheets, so short ex explanatory videos that that uh, are easy to share in the different platforms are different. Uh, def definitely a way to go forward. As said before, um, governments, but also other actors have made um, special attempts to um, reach out to influencers and, pro and provide them with um, specific information. This is something also that needs to be considered and uh, could perhaps be a way good or, or be an area where um, such a new governance institution um, such as the council or the house uh, could support the community by taking this sort of uh, um, stronger networking function and uh, and and bring really bring the information to the to the people communicating it. And finally, as um, we are dealing with lay people, um, normal consumers, normal people from the street. The information should not only be easy to understand in English, but also be available as in as many languages as possible. And this is something also where um, where uh, European institutions, networking institutions, could play a uh, central supporting role. That's our work in Garfornano in brief. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to present some of our insights for you and also happy to answer any questions you might have either now or, or um, later per mail or phone. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Miko, for that. Uh, if you could just stop sharing your screen, if that'll be okay, and then we can go on to move on to the question time uh so an opportunity for people in the room if they want to ask questions uh of one or more of the speakers or just any raise any points of discussion uh <clears throat> if there's a flood i suggest people put their hands up if not i just uh suggest to, if somebody has a question if you just want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask and then we can direct it to the most relevant speaker Okay, so if there's nothing uh, sort of immediately forthcoming, perhaps I could uh, start off by just asking Miko quickly. So do you feel that there's been little change then in the sort of way people are thinking about nanomaterials uh, over the last few years? I guess um, the views on nanomaterials or the public perceptions have remained quite constant. But what we see in other technology fields that are um, stronger under the public debate, be it wind, energy, wind power, vaccines, uh, or so on, we um, sort of see overall this phenomenon that, um, that, that um, expert knowledge is uh, questioned or uh, brought to the same level as individ individual experiences. And I guess this is the sort of area that um, we want, wanted to focus on in our work so that we see the situation at the moment for nanomaterials, public perception is quite good, but still some, as something that we, where we need to sort of prepare ourselves for, for uh, possible, possible debates. Okay. And if there's no other further questions, just a quick one for Tracy. Uh, and I was just wondering, from a, an American perspective, if you see anything, uh, any sort of difference in the US in terms of public perception of nanomaterials? I don't think so, Sean. I think we see about the same right now as your experience in the EU. Um, there's nothing out there that is um, controversial. Um, many of the 
articles that appear here in the US are very positive and related to um, how nanomaterials are helping with environmental issues. And uh, so it, it, it is very positive right now. Of course, once in a while, you'll get something um, that comes out about nanomaterial usage and makeup or sunscreens, things like that. Um, but most of those are, are uh, few and far between at this point. Okay. And I think it's due to a lot of proactive communication by companies like us as well. Excellent, thank you for that, Tracy. And again, if people have questions, please feel free just to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Uh, if not, if I can just quickly come to uh, maybe Marie, Valentine, and Rob, and just sort of ask briefly about the sort of Nana House. Uh, if, for example, I mean, Tracy was saying that one of the roles uh, that obviously good communication plays in industry is to deal with uh, any negative messages that might emerge. And I was just wondering how you feel that a Nano House might be able to deal with if there was a new if there was a, a negative message that started coming out around nanomaterials um i'll try to answer that question which i always find difficult to answer uh because what we've seen uh over the three years of this project is the large diversity of views uh, regarding this question um we've seen that um Various stakeholders have very different uh, opinions about what would be needed, helpful, um, uh, starting with whether there is a problem or not. You know, so 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 this is this is why we are we are trying to find what I would call the niche the niche approach. You know, um, and uh, we are not so much in favor of of um, sort of established formal institutions, but more of uh, if I would even say. Although in that respect, please, I'm just speaking for myself. I cannot uh, engage others in that. Uh, this is my personal opinion that it might, it is often more um, uh, effective to start uh, small, um, to say this is a temporary initiative. It will continue only if it succeeds in the next uh, year or two, uh, if, it manage, if it manages to get support, uh, both intellectually and financially. And if uh, at the end of its first uh, round of production, people say, hey, this is nice, we like it, and we would like it to continue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So again, if anybody has any further questions, uh, otherwise I've got to keep thinking of them. So no, maybe uh, for Chiara, uh, it's interesting uh, what you sort of said about how something that was such a, a simple academic article could be so sort of misrepresented. Uh, does that have wider implications in terms of looking broader than just nanomaterials, but thinking about advanced materials as a whole? I think that the answer is probably yes, um, because obviously I picked the example of nanomaterials because of today's topic and, and our activities, obviously, but this misrepresentations are, are quite frequent also in, uh, in other fields. So I, I probably think that this is going to also uh, work for advanced materials as well. Okay, thank you for that, Chiara. And I don't know if people, if there are any sort of final Last questions that people may have, if anybody has anything they want to ask of any of the speakers or any discussion points that they want to raise. Uh, otherwise, I think we will draw the webinar to an end. But I'll open the floor if anybody has anything. No. If not, then it gives me great pleasure to say thank you to all of the speakers uh, who have presented today, who I think have given excellent presentations and given some uh, interesting insights and some certainly good ideas uh, that I think people need to take away and, and think about. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Nano Safety Cluster who have supported this event as well, uh, and also thank the audience for coming along and listening. And uh, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day and thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.